about you, but there's, there's a lot of things that happen around this time that don't necessarily have anything to do with Christmas and the coming of our King. Okay? Um, they've started calling it um, the Winter Festival or uh, Winter Light Nights. You know, they light up the Christmas lights, but they don't, can't call them Christmas anymore. So they call them Winter Lights. Um, and there's lots of confusion over what it's all about. You, you can probably just make out from my picture. There's a nativity scene with uh, Father Christmas, Christmas trees and elves and sails going on in front of it. Uh, not really quite sure which is more important. Um, the Christmas of today, where we're encouraged to buy more and more things. And, um, and it's quite a confusing message at the end of the day. There's, there's traditions that have built up around this time of year, not just in our country, but throughout the world, which you think about, wonder what on earth that's got to do with Christmas. Okay, here, here's a few of them, okay? Um, we're going to start off with this one. Now, uh, who speaks Spanish? Can someone pronounce that for me? Caguteo? No, I don't know. How's it pronounced? Come on. Cacatillo? Cacatillo. Okay, very good. Okay. Cacatillo is a Spanish tradition um, and it basically is meaning emptying your bowels. Now, what on earth has that got to do with Christmas? Well, actually what's happened in uh, Cacatillo is that um, when you bring in the Christmas logs, the logs for the fire at winter time, you dress one of the logs in this sort of outfit, you draw a face on the end of it and, and put a red hat on, on the top of it. And the idea is that the children will come in and start bashing it, okay, with a stick um, and sing Christmas songs. Um, and the, the idea of bashing it is that you encourage the Yule log, or whatever it's called, Tagatio, to empty its bowels of sweets. Very bizarre. Isn't that a bizarre tradition to have at this time of year? Okay, let's have a look at another one. Night of the Radishes. Here we go. Uh, this is a Mexican festival, and these are radishes that you're not supposed to eat because they're pumped full of chemicals to bloat them up so they're extra, extra huge, and then they make life-size statues out of them, and sculptures and things. Obviously, that's got a lot to do with Christmas. Bizarre. And uh, one of my favourites here, this is, this is an interesting one. This is a Swedish custom, and there's a town called Gavel, I think it's pronounced, Gavel, where they erect a giant goat made of straw. That tradition? Uh, it's about now, it's uh, 30 days before Christmas, um, they, they erect this in the middle of the town, gigantic thing, you can see it towering over everybody. And um, it's been going now for about 40 years, this tradition. Now, theory is it was an act of vandalism at the start when they erected this, that one night in the first year, it got burnt down by a vandal. And bizarrely, ever since then, the tradition has become that the town's, uh, town's mayor um, charges a guardian squad to look after 24 hours a day this gigantic goat, and the townsfolk have to try and secretly burn it to the ground before Christmas. And they do it by dressing up as elves and Father Christmases and secretly trying to mingle with the crowds and then throw a flame to the goat and see if they can set fire to it. What a bizarre tradition. But apparently that's what goes on in Sweden. Okay, things don't always make sense at the end of the day. What on earth is the point of it all? Now, a lot of us, hopefully as Christians, have an idea of this. But if you've got no particular faith, what would you make of all these traditions? What is the point of Christmas? We're entering just about to start Advent, when we count down to Christmas. This is the season. But what is the reason for the season? 
Well, if anyone was to ask you that question, would you be prepared to answer them? Would you have an answer for them? It's not obvious in some ways because we're bombarded with messages about, well, it's all about the spirit of Christmas. It, if you ever watch Christmas films, they always talk about the spirit of Christmas and how we're all supposed to be nice to each other and, and loving and kind and giving and, and all of that stuff. But is that really what Christmas is all about? What is the point? Well, in 1 Peter 3 verse 15 it says this, If someone asks about your Christian hope, always be ready to explain it. So, are you ready? Do you have an explanation? We're going to look at that today. Why Christmas? I mean, we can say, well, you know, Jesus was born our King Cain, you know, and he, be he became a baby, and that's what Christmas is all about. Yeah, but why? Why Christmas? Why did Jesus come? What was it all, what was it all for? Well, we have to go back to the beginning. We have to look at God himself. God has two sides to his nature. One is that he is, um, this holy God of ours is perfect in a sense of love. He is the perfect expression of love. He is the definition of love. That's his nature. There is nothing but love within him. But also, he is a holy God, holy perfect and just. There is no imperfection in him. He cannot allow imperfection to exist in his presence because that would make him imperfect. So we have a loving God but a perfectly just God. Two sides to his nature. What happens when you get this combination? Well, firstly, the desire um, in a perfect loving God is that, well, love is about sharing. Obviously, you need someone to share love with, otherwise it's not an expression at all. Um, so God's love led him to create us, human beings. This is a shortened version of the entire Genesis experience, but ultimately speaking, this is how I'm summing it all up. God's love shared with who? us. So he creates human beings. Now, that's great, but he could create anything. We could create objects that um, love us, yeah? But if we don't give that object, uh, a statue or whatever we create, free will, the ability to choose to love us, they're not loving us at all. We can't make something to love us. And God can't make us to love him. He can only make us with the potential to love us, to love him. Yeah? Do you understand that? In other words, you've got to ha be able to choose to love or it's not love at all. So God creates human beings, mankind, with the ability to choose. God or not God. Love or hate. Yeah. What does that create? That creates a problem, a cosmic problem, if you like, that if God has created human beings with the ability to choose something other than himself, that means we can choose to do ultimately the opposite of God. The opposite of God is God is good, loving, kind, everything, life, and everything comes from him. The opposite of that is evil, and destruction, and death, and it's not really a nice choice, but ultimately that is the choice that we have. We each seem to choose things that are not the best. In Genesis 6, verse 5, God looks at the world that he's made, and he says this, The Lord saw how great man's wickedness on the earth had become and that everything they thought or imagined was consistently and totally evil. So the Lord was sorry he ever made them 
and put them on the earth, it broke his heart. Have you ever thought about that? We have the potential to break God's heart. Because God gave us the, the ability to choose, we have the ability to really hurt God. Now, that, um, that piece of scripture comes from the whole story of Noah and the flood and the way God dealt with it initially was to wipe everyone out apart from Noah who was faithful in his family. Why did he do that? Well, because he has to satisfy this nature that he has. Yes, he loves the creation he made, mankind, but he cannot allow mankind into his presence if they are not perfect, if they make mistakes, if they choose evil rather than good. But without that choice, they can't choose to love God. And so we end up keep falling into the trap of doing the wrong thing. And God has to justify both his sense of justice and his sense of love. His nature of love and his nature of perfect holiness. Now, we as man may well want to get back into what we were made for, a loving relationship with God. That is what God wants. But man on his own has a problem. Nothing he does will ever get him back to God. There's a great chasm between us and God. We can try through good works. We can try through religious ritual. We can try by doing good things. But nothing is totally pure. We are all human, after all. And everything we do is just a tainted, just a slight taint of selfish motivation. We are human. We make mistakes. We are human. We are driven to get the best that we can for ourselves. And no matter how much we try, somewhere along the line we will fail. And so, like, uh, we build a ladder or a bridge across this gap, no matter how much we try, it will fall into the chasm. And God has this problem. What is he going to do? How is he going to solve this cosmic problem? To send Jesus. Jesus came as a baby. We know the story. He came to Bethlehem through Mary and grew up and showed an example of how to live because he lived a sinless life. Christmas is ultimately, yes, about Jesus coming as a baby. But why did Jesus have to come to earth? Why didn't God just snap his fingers and say, let's sort it all out? He's all-powerful, almighty after all. Well, remember that um, we're the problem. And an Old Testament scripture may give us an idea in Leviticus not many of us read Leviticus 16, verse 10. It talks about a scapegoat. The scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to be used for making atonement. Why did Jesus come to earth as a baby? Because he had to become human. Only a human could stand to be punished for the mistakes of human beings. But... We needed a scapegoat. A scapegoat in the Old Testament was basically designed to place the sins of the nation on and to be cast out, to be cast in place of everyone else. That's where the word scapegoat comes from. Jesus became our scapegoat, which actually makes more sense of the Jewish tradition of having a huge goat erected in the middle of the town. Maybe that's what they're referring to. Jesus, the scapegoat, coming to earth for our sins to take the punishment that we deserve. Now, 
Jesus did eventually die. Obviously, that's it all started at Christmas. Is everyone free now because Jesus has died? Are we all free? Have we broken our chains, hold us back? Are we able to have that loving relationship with God? Well, yes and no, because we still have free will. We still have to make a choice to either accept that gift or reject it. Are you willing to accept that gift? Many of us here have. Some may not have done. If it's haven't accepted Jesus' free gift, then come and talk to me afterwards. Let anyone accept this who can. That's the message of Christmas. And if someone asks you what the meaning of the season is all about, the meaning is that Jesus came to die for us because we needed a scapegoat. We needed to satisfy both sides of God's nature and without him we were powerless to reach God. That is the fantastic thing about Christmas. If you ever get into a conversation this year as a Christian, this is what should be on the tip of your lips to explain to people about your faith through the message of Christmas. It's the reason. Let's pray.